Senator Duckworth, first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Thank How you. are you feeling? I feel great. I'm, I'm thrilled and happy, and I'm glad to be at this stage of the pregnancy where I know things are going to be okay. Um, you have been very open about uh, how difficult it was mm -hmm. to get pregnant a second time. You went through multiple courses mm -hmm. of IVF, um, and that can be a very all-consuming and stressful mm -hmm. process. Tell me a little bit about what it was like for you. Well, it, it, was, it was a difficult pregnancy. The first pregnancy, um, conceiving Abigail, it took me almost 10 years of trying and three years of IVF to going through you know, gradually more complicated procedures to get to Abigail. Um, but with this baby, uh, I ended up having a miscarriage and, and, and multiple cycles again. And I just wanted to be honest because I know that there's so many families out there struggling with infertility issues. And as, um, as more women deal with fertility issues and trying to balance their career and their, and, and, and their personal lives and put off pregnancy until later, I just, I just wanted people to know that this is a far more common than people realize and that we all struggle. Right, and what did your doctor say to you about the chances of getting pregnant at 49? Well, he said it's the new 40. So he said 50, a 50 year old mom is a new 40. <laughs> and I have the most wonderful fertility doctor in, uh, in Chicago at Northwestern University. And uh, he helped me with Abigail. And he just said, if you're willing to go through the process with me step by step, it will seem like it takes a long time, but we want to do this right. Um, we, we can get to an outcome for you. He, you know, he couldn't promise, but he said, well, you'll have the best shot anywhere to get into it now. I mean, he was right, and we just, I just had to be patient and go through that. It was very much different from my life here, oftentimes, because I had to give up control <laughs> right. to someone else, a process I had no control over. And right. it's very different when you're, you know, first a congressman, now a senator, where you're sort of used to being in charge, and you have no control. It's kind of like being a mom. You have no control. <laughs> yeah, and I want to, you know, I, I wonder how you feel yeah. about having to, because you know, I remember that feeling when I had one, I felt like a super mom. And mm -hmm. then once you have the second one, all those illusions are shattered. Oh, well, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't feel like a super mom during the first baby. I, I decided to run for the United States Senate um, when I was on maternity leave, which was a leap of faith to do that. So I was a congresswoman, I was trying to breastfeed, travel, campaign, do my job as a United States congresswoman with this, you know, infant, uh, six month old and then a year old. And it was really, really tough. There were a lot of tears and a lot of why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. And I just want to be home with my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, but then I would come across situations that needed to be fixed, like legislation that I could pass. And I realized, no, I have to do this. This, this makes me a better, a better legislator. And, and I feel like it's going to make me a better senator to have two babies. <laughs> one, of the things, one of the things that you noticed uh -huh. uh, when you were doing all that traveling was that a lot of airports didn't have anywhere for you to nurse. No, and, and, and I would go into airports and I said, well, it's, it's the handicapped stall in the public toilet. And I was like, that's disgusting. You would eat a sandwich there. Why would you think that I should nurse my baby there or pump breast milk there? That's wrong. I mean, if you want to nurse in public, that's fine, anybody can. But a lot of time I didn't have my baby and I was pumping breast milk and I didn't want to pump, plug my breast pump in next to where everyone else was charging their cell phones and try to pump breast milk in public. It was humiliating, and and um, so I tried to make you know tried to pass some legislation on it, and it, it's out of um, committee. Uh, mandatory uh, uh, nursing rooms for for moms uh, at airports, and hopefully we'll get an FAA bill, and it will become law. How many uh, how many airports were lacking those facilities? The vast majority of them. Um, there was a survey done, and about only about twenty or thirty percent said that they had something. But that included the, the uh, handicapped stall of the to public toilet. So um, really the reality was only a handful. It's much better now, and many airports uh, have put some in, um, but there are not enough of them. Is that what you mean when you say that becoming a mom made you a better legislator? It did, exactly. Those examples um, really made me better at serving my constituency, uh, uh, both in Illinois and across the country. Um, I, I had a cesarean with my first daughter, um, and uh, it was an emergency cesarean. And then, you know, I've learned about military women who were being forced to go back on duty six weeks after having their own cesarean. And I couldn't imagine going, being told, sorry, you have to report to Afghanistan and leave your six week old infant behind, and you're trying to recover from the cesarean, but we're deploying and you have to go. And that's what we were doing to military moms. We, um, before we got together and, and, and changed the rule 
But so it does make me better at serving my country. I think it makes our DOD stronger that we have a better maternity pater, um, parental leave policy there now, and I think it makes our nation uh, more powerful and, and, and better in the world. You took 12 weeks off with mm -hmm. your first mm -hmm. child, correct? Um, and you know, you probably feel very lucky mm -hmm. to have that kind of time because so many women in this country um, mm -hmm. either don't get maternity leave or they can take the time off mm -hmm. but not get paid. It seems like the country really hasn't made many strides when it comes to that issue. That's true. And even in my own office in the house, um, before I, I got pregnant with Abigail um, in, uh, uh, a year after I became a congresswoman, and I had my leave policy was pretty much what the standard leave policy was. And when I got pregnant, I started looking at the leave policy, and I realized it was not adequate. So I changed my office's leave policy that everyone gets 12 weeks uh, family or parental leave, and I do that here in the Senate. But we're one of the few offices that that does that, and so um, you know it's something that I'm working on now. We can't be a competitive nation on a global scale economically if we don't have family leave policies that support all of our workers so that they can take care of their families and do their jobs. We're not going to attract the, big, the brightest and the best. They're going to go someplace else. And if we want to compete economically, then we have to provide these, uh, these safeguards and this support for, for our families. And, and in fact, it costs our families more if families can't take care of each other because you then start having to rely on nursing homes and, and, and all sorts of stuff. And so um, I sort of see what I do at home addressing issues that are very personal to me is something that carries on to my, my job here in the halls of Congress. President Trump campaigned on six weeks of mm -hmm. paid maternity leave. Yeah. Have you seen any progress on that? I have not seen any progress on that whatsoever, but I'm, uh, uh, maybe sounds a little disillusioned, but I, I haven't seen a lot of promises kept by this administration, which is unfortunate because it does hurt our nation. Uh, I, we can't compete with nations in Europe, for example. Uh, uh, we're the last developed nation to not have, you know, mandatory family leave. Have you reached out to the White House to say, I want to work with you on that issue? I feel strongly about it, too, as the president seems mm -hmm. to. They know how to get a hold of me. <laughs> Trust me, there's a whole bunch of, I'm, and I'm not the only one. There are quite a few of us that are bipartisan that are, mm -hmm. that, that really want to work on this and have been working on this, and uh, we would love to be able to come to some sort of an agreement. Um, you are the first, uh, person of Thai descent to be elected to Congress. You are the first disabled woman in the Senate, the first person to give birth while in the Senate. That's a lot of firsts. Yeah. How does that feel? Unintentional. <laughs> it, well, the whole being the first uh, sitting senator to give birth, I think, is ridiculous. It's 2018. We need more female senators. We are only 22 of us, and that is not accurate representation of where the nation is. And so we need to encourage more young women uh, to think about running for public office at all levels. And, and I want both Democrats and Republicans because the Women's Caucus here, where the Republican and, and, and Democratic women get together, is very effective. We work very well together. So I want more women here so that we better represent this country. So yes, that's a first. But I've been a little overwhelmed by how landmark it is when it shouldn't be. It's, tw it's a 21st century. Um, as for being the first uh, Thai you know, uh, uh, elected to office, again, we don't have enough Asians in elected office across this nation. Asians are underrepresented, and yet we are the growing, fastest growing population. So when it comes to issues of things like family reunification in, um, in the immigration, in immigration reform or with DACA, you know, this is something where, where it's uniquely Asian voices who can speak to that experience and who can fight for those issues, and, as I'm doing here. And we need more diversity here. We need more disabled people with disabilities to be here as well, to, uh, so that we can push for all of those things. There must have been a period of time, perhaps when you were at Walter Reed being treated after you were shot down, that you thought you might never have children. Right. There, there was. I, um, uh, uh, at the time, I, my husband and I had said, you know, let's, let's. We were thinking about maybe starting a family, but then the deployment came up, and said, so well, when we come back from deployment, I was 34, 35 at the time. Um, when, when the deployment is over, the 18 months is over, we'll talk about it then. Of course, I get wounded, spend a year recovering. And then um, what's really interesting is that among the first five women who were wounded, who came home as amputees from Iraq, four of us were, we got pregnant at the same time 10 years later. And we had some very ideal circumstances, and it took 10 years post-war. And so that's how long it often takes for troops to get their lives back together. 
after serving in conflict. And that says something about what that experience does and why we need to support military men and women. But there was a chance that I would not be able to have children, and, and I'm just so glad that I can. And did you have doctors saying to you, it would be too hard on your body, don't do that to yourself? No, it, it wasn't so much that at all. Um, they always said that I should be able to have children, um, mm -hmm. uh, but I just couldn't get pregnant uh, and, and uh, for a long time. And there are unexplained reasons why there is greater infertility among uh, female military veterans and women in the general population. And so that's something that I'm in encouraging the VA and DOD to do research into, because it is much higher rates of infertility among military women than it is the rest of American population. Did you dream about going into politics before all of this happened? Oh my Lord, never. <laughs> I wanted to work for the State Department. My dream as a child was to uh, uh, take the Foreign Service exam and being a Foreign Service officer and travel the world and represent my country. And mm -hmm. that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. <laughs> and um, the State of the Union is coming up yes. this week. You, by chance, were invited to attend the State of the Union with Senator mm -hmm. Durbin back in 2005. Mm -hmm. And was that what sort of uh, sparked a flame in you to want to go into public office? That's what started the process, I think. Um, uh, uh, it was Senator Durbin who found me in the hospital. He invited all Illinois servicemen and women at Walter Reed, all wounded warriors, to, to go to the State of the Union. And I was one of two who was well enough to go. It was my first trip out of the hospital, um, just not too many weeks after I'd been wounded. And uh, um, it was very emotional um, to go into that gallery, gallery and look down and see this democracy that I just sacrificed for. It was overwhelming. I mean, it still gets to me, um, that feeling. And, uh, and I was missionless. I was missionless. I was a helicopter pilot with no legs. And I was trying to find a way to serve my country. And we were having issues at Walter Reed, not with the medical care, which was amazing, but there were support issues under the Bush administration. And I just became an advocate for my buddies because I happened to be the highest ranking amputee patient. And so I met Senator Durbin that night, and he made the mistake of giving me his personal phone number <laughs> on the back of his business card, and I just started calling him. I didn't know any better. I just started calling a United States Senator and saying, look, we got a guy who hasn't been paid. We got a person over here where the Army won't pay for his mom to come see him. I'm da -da 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 -da. And no matter where they were from, Senator Durbin took care of them. And after about 10 months of this, he called me up and he said, you need to run for Congress. You're pretty persistent. You're pretty persistent. <laughs> You're, you need to run for Congress. We need more voices for veterans in, in office. And that's how I got into politics was a mentor, someone who became a mentor who said, we need your voice here. We need a non-politician voice. We need you here. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got into this. It's crazy. <laughs> and now you're standing uh, on the floor of the Senate um, and taking on the president on military issues. Just last week, uh, you accused him of trying to spark a war with North Korea. Uh, do you really think that he is itching for military confrontation? I think he's reckless in how he speaks about America's capabilities and America's might. We are the greatest democracy and the greatest military power on the face of the earth. That is not something you squander, and that's not something you chest thump over. Mm -hmm. You have it. Exercise it with full leadership. And unfortunately, he's reckless, boasting about our nuclear capabilities, engaging in what I feel is petty contests over Twitter with a dictator of a country that is starving. Now, they're developing nuclear weapons, and they're a real threat, North Korea is. But, but talking about the size of your nuclear button is not, it's not appropriate for the president of the greatest military. The, you know, he's the commander in chief on the face of the earth. And, and, and that's just wrong. And I think that that endangers our nation's security, and it endangers the lives of the men and women who are on the front lines right now. Look, 19 year old standing in the DMZ, I just saw them two weeks ago. And they're willing to die to protect us. They deserve better than a commander who is going to be so flippant about the sacrifices that they're going to make. You called him a five deferment draft dodger mm -hmm. and Captain Bonespur? Cadet. Cadet Bonespur, Cadet. You a demotion. No, not a, not a demotion. <laughs> a cadet is the highest military rank he ever reached in his life. He was a cadet at an academy, um, but he never actually served. So uh, if he had served and enlisted, 
I would have caught him by whatever his rank was, but he never served. He got five deferments, four for uh, school and one for uh, medical reasons that he can't even remember what foot the bone spur was in. I can still feel the hangnail on my right foot, <laughs> and, it's, and it's missing, and, let a, you know, and, and we have a guy who says that uh, he had a bone spur that kept him out of Vietnam, but doesn't remember where it was. Do you think that that disqualifies him from being commander-in-chief or making decisions about the military? No, I think he was elected rightfully to be president of the United States by this country, and that is the, the job that he's in. But I don't think that he has the right to question uh, other people's support for our military, especially those of us who have served, especially those of us who, as I have, spent my entire adult life caring for the well-being, the training, the equipping of the men and women that I was responsible for. And so to very, in very charged rhetoric say that what I, you know, what somebody who didn't agree with him was doing was endangering the military, which are truly not true, not even accurate statements um, in the opinion of the DOD itself. Um, you know, I just felt like there was only a handful of us here who can stand up and, and repudiate that. Mm. I'm one of them. So as someone who served in the military, made an enormous sacrifice, uh, was in a leadership role at the Veterans Administration, what do you think is the main thing that's going overlooked right now by Congress, by the White House, when it comes to military readiness? Well, I think there's two things. Uh, one, the military is absolutely wounded and, and endangered by the budget problems that we have right now. Year after year of sequestration, year after year of continuing resolution, Congress not doing its job with the administration, and the administration not working with Congress to pass a real budget is hurting the military. It's why we've seen more accidents. You know, our pilots are not flying the number of flying hours they need to. Our ship commander, our ship captains are not out there, you know, uh, doing the exercises that they need because we are not providing them with the resources to do that. And that endangers lives. Uh, um, uh, only a small, you know, it's less than 50% of the Marine Corps attack uh, uh, fighter jets are actually fully operational. Mm -hmm. we're, we're in a situation where the military is stretched incredibly thin to do uh, multiple missions around the globe, and, and we're asking them to do more and more, and they keep stepping up. But we don't resource them to do it, so we have to fix that problem. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also think that uh, uh, the American people don't understand the direness of the situation in places like North Korea and, and the situation and, and how close we are to outright war there and, and how we need to take the lead in the world when it comes to resolving the situation there. Um, and, and frankly, my colleagues and I haven't done our job in Congress of, of uh, having those discussions and that debate in front of the American people of what this will cost. When you have Secretary Tillerson going out and saying, yeah, we should send more troops into Syria. As a citizen, I want to know what that, what that means. What are you committing us to? And who declared war on Syria on behalf of the American people? Because Congress certainly didn't. And who debated this? No one. I want to know, and I want the American people to know what that's going to cost, why we're doing it. And if it's the right thing to do, then, then I'll vote for it. But we need to know why, because we didn't have that in the run-up to Iraq. And we're still there. And obviously the military is suffering right yeah. now mm -hmm. as Congress funds the entire government for just a mm -hmm. few weeks at a time. Right. The military, you know, and even when we give the military more money than the rest of our society, the problem that we have is that the military is our society, right? Uh, the DOD put out a study just um, not too long ago, um, about a year or so ago, saying that they can actually only recruit from about 29% of the population because the rest of the population had some sort of untreated health condition as a child, like asthma or ADHD, or um, they can't, they don't have a, a high school diploma or can't pass the English and math test. And so our military can't even recruit from the full pool of young people who are, should be eligible to serve because we haven't made those investments in public education and children's health care and all of these things that grow a healthy population that the military can draw on. Well, it takes a mom to see that big picture. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for talking to us. Thank you. For Congratulations. Me. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. And good luck. Thank you.